You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached the age of 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials, or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription, or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health podcast, and I have uh, James J. Hickman. He's the founder of a company called Hesperos, H-E-S-P-E-R-O-S. The website is uh, Hesperos, Inc., I-N-C dot com. Well, tell me about the, about the company. What the, you know, you told me offline what the name means. You know, if you don't mind mentioning that again, and then um, you know, tell me how the idea for this company came together. Well, Hesperos um, actually started in 2000, um, and it was a holding company for my IP. But I started collaborating with Michael Schuler about eight nine years ago, and then we basically took my technology I had been de- developing which are functional in vitro systems and serum free medias, and then added it to his multi-organ metabolic systems and came up with a, you know, something really was better than the uh, uh, the two parts separately. And so we started the company as a real company in um, beginning of 2015. And so we've been around now since then, and um, we're now about 20 people, and we're focusing on um, – a human on a chip technology um, that comes from Michael Schuler had created the uh, term body on a chip about 20 years ago. They came up with the first patents on basically taking different cell types and linking them with uh, a fluidic flow. Um, but you then combine that with the technologies I've been developing, which is a functional system. So, you know, what does a functional system mean? Um, if you go into a doctor's office, um, he doesn't immediately take your blood and look at your biomarkers. Okay. What he does is he says, well, you know, how you doing? Sees how you reply, looks at your eyes, you know, looks to see your gait. Are you walking? Are you limping? Are you listening to the one side? You know, those are functional readouts. He's looking at how your nerves are controlling your muscles. He's looking at how your brain is functioning in terms of cognition. Um, and then he listens to your heart. He looks and says, you know, is your heart beating? He's looking at the heart rate. Um, then he might non-invasively take your blood pressure. These are all also functional readouts. And so what we try and do is we recreate those functions like muscle contraction, nerves innervating muscle and, and causing that contraction, cardiac electrical activity, cardiac force. Um, neuronal communication, neurons basically sending electrical impulses to each other. And we combine that in a multi-organ system where the fluid is recirculating, okay? And so they're all, the the organs are all talking to each other. And so when we put liver in there, then we can actually then look at not only a drug, but the liver generally metabolizes a drug into um, different compounds some of which sometimes can be toxic. In some cases, they're deliberately the drug that they want. They want to see whether or not, um, you know, when the liver metabolizes, that's the more active form of the drug. Um, And so we can then look at the, what they call the parent compound and the metabolite in the same system. Um, And that's pretty much what a human on a chip system does. We can add in barrier tissues like GI tract, your intestines, 
you know, to control as compounds or how it gets into the system. We can also add the other barrier, another barrier tissue called the blood-brain barrier, which is the, you know, the interface between your blood supply and your brain, because your brain really doesn't like, you know, all the components through in the blood. It likes to carefully filter those out. Um, you know, very people don't realize that there's in your bloodstream, it's about 8% protein. And in your cerebral spinal fluid, which bathes your neurons, it's actually 0.001 because your brain likes to really control the interactions because there's so much communication, not only with electrical impulses, but also with molecules going on there. So we can build a blood-brain barrier into the system as well. And we're working with kidneys and other types of organs as well. I don't know how you're supposed to make a model a multi-organ system on a chip. I mean, each organ itself is super complicated and the fluid flowing between them, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it has all kinds of things. There's nutrition going in it. There's signaling. There's, uh, there's all kinds of things going on. I mean, how, how far have you been able to model? And, uh, and I don't know, is it correlating to real world phenomena? Right. What's an so example took... of the system you've made and how good is it? So we've actually been able to show in a four organ system, the proper response to drugs. We've been able to, and that's been published. Um, we just got a paper accepted in Science Translational Medicine where we looked at, for the first time, the idea of looking at efficacy, which is does a drug work, and toxicity in the same system, okay? And so they call this off-target toxicity. And this is done in collaboration with Roche Pharmaceuticals. And what we were able to show is they said, well, okay, can you take a non-multidrug resistant cancer and a multidrug resistant cancer? Put it in the same recirculating fluid that you have cardiac tissue because most of your chemotherapeutics have some sort of cardiac toxicity and the presence of a liver because also chemotherapeutics are toxic to liver, but also they have a lot of chemotherapeutics are converted into toxic species so the, um, by the liver. And so we then took in that four compartment system two different types of cancer, um, a cardiac force measurement, a cardiac electrical measurement, and then liver. So it's basically a five-chambered um, system, okay, and recirculating, and looked at a drug called tamoxifen, which is a standard chemotherapeutic, and showed that the tamoxifen by itself wasn't very effective on reducing proliferation of either cancer. But its metabolite, hydroxytamoxifen, was for the non multi drug resistant cancer. And one of the reasons that uh, cancer cells become multi drug resistant is there's these pumps inside of them that pump out um, the chemotherapeutic as fast as it comes in. But you can add a second drug in that blocks that pump. In this case, we use something called verapamil, so, which is a drug drug combination. And we were then showed that we could stop the proliferation of even the multi-drug resistant cancer, okay? At the same time, we were monitoring the cardiac function and the liver function. And what we saw is the electrical activity and the force both um, were affected and they were decreased, okay, uh, in the presence of the tamoxifen and hydroxytamoxifen, but recovered, okay? And so they recovered after a couple of days, and which is, again, if you're trying to then you know, understand how a chemotherapeutic might affect an individual patient, that's really good information for a physician to have. But when we added in the second drug to block the multidrug resistant cancer, um, uh, pushing the drug out of the cells, um, and it decreased the proliferation, but it also increased the toxicity, okay? So the drug-drug combination increased the toxicity, and it didn't recover as well. So again, if a, if a physician was looking at this data, looking at your cancer, he'd be able to say, okay, I got to try a different uh, PGP or inhibitor of this pump than the verapamil, okay? And so this way he could actually do this testing, which right now they do on people, okay? And so this is now we could actually take your cancer and look and see how different drugs, different combinations of drugs, and be able to test this to be able to inform a physician. It wouldn't be a diagnostic because that involves the FDA and everything else like that. But a physician tries to take as much information he can from as many different sources as he can. And this now enables that to happen in a system and something that could be done within a couple of weeks. 
So what uh, is the recirculating fluid made of? And if this is proprietary, just say so. But what is this recirculating fluid made of? What are the organ? You know, how are the organs modeled? Like even one of the organs, how do you model it on a chip? All right. So what we do is. What I developed about 25 years ago was the first serum-free medium. Most people who are doing this research are still stuck using calf serum, okay? The problem with calf serum is it's calf serum, okay? And it's also from a baby, okay? And so when they actually drain the fluid out of the calf, um, the calf is either dead or terrified. Um, and so there's all these hormones and things like that in there that aren't really good for cells. But there's also a lot of things that need to basically say, you know, you need to be a calf. Um, so by using serum, a lot of cells will de-differentiate. And this is a problem that most labs have. By using a serum-free media, okay, which is not proprietary, we published it, and variations of it, okay, we've been able to figure out how to keep four and five cell types alive for up to four weeks in this circulating serum-free medium. And that paper was just published in Advanced Functional Materials, where we took it out for 28 days, okay? 28 days being a magical period, because if you're going to measure toxicity in an animal for systemic tox, then generally they will do that experiment for 28 days, okay? Um, and what we do is we use a different pumping mechanism as well. Instead of using a peristaltic pump or or something that actually compressive type pump, we just simply use gravity. And we believe this is actually better for the cells, okay? It causes less stress on the cells. And the other key thing is we're not trying to reproduce the anatomy, okay? People try and say, well, 3D is, is obviously better than 2D. Not always. If I'm trying to make a, an organ that I'm going to implant in somebody's body, obviously, obviously you need to have it to be 3D. If I'm trying to create a system to test the function, all I've got to do is recreate the function. So what we do is we try to get the cells in a healthy, mature state and integrate them with these silicon-based devices called microelectromechanical systems, or biomems has been it's been called. Okay. And this allows us to create hybrid 3D systems, which allows us to have the function. <coughs> of the organs without having to preserve the anatomy or reproduce the anatomy. There's a whole field. Oh, okay. And then the cells themselves, how do you get them? Let's say the liver, you know, do you biopsy someone's liver and culture those well, cells no. or how do you, how do you get them? Well, actually people donate livers. Um, and then, you know, they know that they're going to be used in research and we can basically buy primary liver cells. And because of our serum pre formulation, we can get them to not de-differentiate in a fairly simple culture um, system. Whereas most people have to go to great lengths to be able to try and um, keep them differentiated in their systems. With the serum free medias, we don't have to do that. With the cardiac cells, we create from induced pluripotent stem cells. The neurons are from induced pluripotent stem cells. The muscle cells are from stellate cells, which are expanded from a biopsy. Um, we can also, we're now getting to the point of being able to do muscle from induced pluripotent stem cells. Um, and some of these we differentiate ourselves. Some of you can just buy. Um, there's companies called CDI. Um, there's you can get cells from Sigma, from Lanza. You know, there's lots of different places to just sell human cells. Um, I've heard of people making organoids uh, to model, you know, let's say cardiac function or other functions. How would you compare what you're making to organoids? What what is an organoid compared to what you're modeling? Yeah, that's the point I was going to, to start addressing is that people will try and reproduce the anatomy, and that's, that's what an organoid will do for you. So it will give you that um, anatomy of a subsystem from the body. Um, that's really good for things like developmental tox, you know, if you're trying to look and see what a compound does and it's starting to develop. The problem with organoids is it's really hard to figure out the function from them, okay, because you – it's really difficult to assay what's going on inside an organoid. So generally what you have to do, you actually have to take it, um, you know, fix it, slice it open, and then do immunostate cytochemistry to look and see actually what was happening with the cells because they haven't yet figured out how to integrate, okay, a, uh, a 
way of measuring function in the systems. There's, there's crude ways of kind of look at some beating and everything, but the problem with an organoid is that you get an oxygen gradient in them because they haven't figured out how to vascularize them yet. And so you get different levels of um, cells dying within, you know, gradients within the organoids. Um, and so that changes their function. So it's, it, it's really good for looking at anatomy, but it's not really good at looking at function. Hmm. It's, it's amazing that you're able to model the function of these organs in, uh, in such a simple way. It's, it's kind of funny. I guess everyone had the assumption that they had to make organoids and make them more and more sophisticated and maybe even 3D print an organ to model things properly, but you're able to do that in a much simpler way. Well, I've been working on it for 25 years. Um, and so that's that's the benefit of Hesperos is that, you know, Mike Schuller basically invented the field 25 years ago. I've been working on these systems for 25 years. Mike's got over, you know, 100 publications or 70, 75 to 100 publications in this space. I've got over 50 publications in this space. You know, we have large research groups that are also, you know, feeding information into the company. We've, you know, basically licensed a whole suite of patents from UCF, where I'm a professor, and also from Cornell, where Mike's a professor, into the company. So that's a real benefit that Hesperos has over lots of companies that are kind of coming up where they really don't know the history of these things, where when somebody says, yeah, 3D is better than 2D, Without knowing the history, they just sort of assume, oh, that's that's true, but it's not true. Um, it is true if you're trying to create in vivo tissue engineering, but it's not necessary for in vitro tissue engineering for many different systems. It is for some, and we do go to 3D when we need to, but in most cases, it's not necessary if you're just trying to reproduce function. So, have you gotten to the point where you've uh, you know you've tested drugs in your system, you've gotten a certain result, and then you've modified? Uh, or you've tested that drug then in people, or you've modified its use and tested it in people, and you've seen a correlation? We have not um, advanced far enough yet, although we're getting there, to be able to have a drug that was tested in our systems get approved for going into a clinical trial. Um, one, but we're heading in that direction because to be able to really convince the FDA to go into a human they they like to have a lot of computer modeling on what the different possibilities are. And generally that is called a PKPD model. So you know how long the drug is sticking around and, and actually how much of it is going to each organ. So they get some idea of the residence time and, and everything for a compound. Um, so what we can do is we can create these PKPD models or pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic models of our in vitro systems. And we're using those and building those to help predict what we think we might happen vivo, okay? And that's how we're going to transition our data, okay, to be able to better inform what's going on in clinical trial and hopefully convince the FDA that somebody's drug will be able to go, is safe to go into a human without doing an animal uh, model. And, and this becomes really, really important if you think about rare diseases, in many cases, the compounds, they don't want to have the risk of going into somebody if they don't have an animal model. Um, and so it's really hard to get, you know, drugs um, approved for use in rare diseases because there's just no good way to assay it beforehand. And the last thing I want to do is put, a, you know, a drug into um, somebody who has a rare disease and have there be a catastrophic problem. I mean, think about all the gene therapies, you know, where they started off just trying to go into humans and then people died as a result of it because they didn't have a really good model system for that. So we can actually be a really good model system because we can take the cells from the rare diseases and build what they call a phenotypic model to be able to reproduce aspects of the disease, okay, and basically show that we can um, reverse it or ameliorate the effects of that generally hereditary or some other type of, of rare disease. Um, at the same time, monitoring the tox, okay? And, and this work could be a huge benefit for looking at rare diseases, as well as looking at more common diseases and conditions um, for the general population. Why not start with a, um, a drug that's in use already so you can get uh, clinical data and look at its impact on other organ systems, maybe to find a second use for it or to see if it has toxicity that maybe wasn't observed when it first came out? Um, and then it can be modified to have less side effects. Why not look there? 
Absolutely. That's that's something that we're definitely working with people on right now, which is a drug to say has been used for something else or has safety data, and they'd be able to show that for another indication that we have efficacy. Exactly one of the things that we're trying to do right now. And and Hesperos is, is leading in the area of trying to do that um, with um, drug companies. Are you seeing any overall themes? I mean, if you look at enough drugs, perhaps you'll see an overall theme, a recurring theme um, in your modeling that would, would maybe uh, steer people in, in a faster direction towards getting uh, the right drugs for people. Well, we're not... We don't have enough replicates at this point and enough disease models to be able to look at that. Um, we are finding um, evidence that um, some drugs that were toxic, the reason they are toxic is because they overaccumulate in certain organs and that those organs actually do metabolize, metabolism on them and it's not the liver, which is really why it was really hard to see. Um, we are seeing some of that and we're working with drug companies on that. Um, and so we are look so but we are doing what you suggested earlier, which is looking at drugs that have either been failed in clinical trials, have actually been approved and then pulled, um, and testing against our system. And we're really pretty good at being able to predict um the results and why they failed. We're also working with certain pharmaceutical companies to examine some of their failed drugs and to see whether or not we can predict the results that they saw, you know, not until late in the process. And we're having pretty good success rate there as well. I would think this should be um, mandatory for a lot of clinical trials at a certain stage so that before you do the trial and get a bad outcome, you can at least model and, and uh, you know change your initial starting condition so it goes better. We believe that's where the future is going to be. I mean, you know, right now, animal models are predictive – um, when you go from an animal model into drug discovery, drug uh, uh, approval process, about only 11% of the drugs survive clinical trials due to tox or not being efficacious. Animal models are just really poor predictors of what's going to happen in a human. Now, people will say, well, you know, some things have worked. That's absolutely correct because you spent trillions of dollars. Something's got to work. Okay. And, and, and in some cases, animal models have been pretty predictive and have worked uh, well. But overall, the percentage is very low. I mean, we've cured over 200 diseases in mice that have not translated to humans. Okay. And this isn't anecdotal. This has actually been um, quantified and looked at in the industry. There's been um, publications. There's a very nice publication by first author is Cook from AstraZeneca from 2004, I believe, where they looked at all their drugs and so why they failed. And the reason is the animal models don't work. And again, going back to this whole idea, you know, in rare diseases, you don't have animal models for most of them, and you're not going to because it's too expensive. So, um, do you have interest in drug companies that they want to use your modeling as part of the clinical uh, trial process so that they go in with the, the best foot forward? We're 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 getting there. Um, most of them are very skeptical still to some degree. Um, you know, some of the smaller drug companies are a little bit more accepting. Um, you know, we're we're now, you know, we've been around for about three, three and a half years. Um, you know, we've had some success. We got this one paper coming out. I think it will be a game changer in scientizational medicine. We have another paper with another pharmaceutical company where we've been able to use our PKPD models of our in vitro system to predict animal data that they had gotten. Um, and, and so we're, we're getting to that point. Um, now we're, we're, we're think they're starting to accept this as, you know, something they should start thinking about incorporating into their approval process. And again, what we'd like to do is be able to start convincing the regulatory authorities that our systems are as good as, if not better than animals, and actually start reducing substantially the amount of animal data that they have to use for a clinical trial, if not eventually one day trying to eliminate it. Uh, how fast can you model uh, a given drug? It really depends upon the drug and the system and, and kind of what they want. Um, you know, if you want something like a neuromuscular junction, something like uh, you want to test a drug against ALS and you want to have a compound, simple, you know, test, does it restore function in a mutant um, model of the neuromuscular junction, we could probably do that test in a couple months. We basically think that we'll also shorten the time um, dramatically in terms of, of drug discovery as well. See, because our systems, we can work directly with a medicinal chemist. 
Okay, people don't realize that one of the biggest problems in drug discovery is, yeah, they screen, you know, hundreds of thousands of compounds, come up with a couple of candidates for a disease or their target or, you know, somehow a phenotypic model they've created. They then have to take variations of this using their computer models, predicting its solubility, its efficacy, and things like that. But then a medicinal chemist has to choose, okay, because they're going to go from milligram quantities to kilograms before they can go into an animal uh, animal, uh, trial, okay? Um, And they have to pick one because it's real expensive to scale that up, okay? With our systems, they could test four, five, six different variations of their primary compound because we only require milligrams. We don't we're not going into an animal model, okay? So this is a way of actually getting, picking the best candidate, not just guessing at what hopefully might be the best candidate. So so I think that's really where, you know, some of the new work that we're doing is, is pointing to, um, and, and again, we'll really shorten the process, we believe. What's a, why not challenge, um, you know, a couple of drug companies that are about to go through a trial or that have gone through a trial and say, hey, I'm going to figure out some proprietary data without you telling me if you let me test your drug on our model. And I'm going to shock you with what I can tell you, and it's going to correlate with what you've seen. You know, don't tell well, I mean, me. If, why not do that? Maybe it's a proof of concept. If somebody had the money to do that, we'd be happy to do it. We're a small startup but, company. We're, we don't have investors. You know, Mike Schuler and I set this company up uh, basically using our own funds. Um, so we don't have a huge, big bankroll out there. We're, we're trying to, we're using NIH grants. We're using our, uh, the customers we have to slowly grow the company. Um, you know, but we're, we're trying to keep control of the, uh, the destiny of the company and not have profit be the only motive, um, you know, um, for forming the company. We also think that we can do a lot of social good with the company again, rare disease spaces, areas that uh, drug companies aren't particularly interested in that still need attention. How, how much uh, ballpark would it cost for you to uh, assay, you know, a certain drug? You said it may take several months at least, but uh, it looks like the ballpark cost. Well, it depends. I, it really depends. I mean, you know, but certainly uh, less than a million dollars. But even for a startup, that, that's a lot. Yeah, that makes sense. Oh, yeah, yeah. If, if somebody was going to willing to come up with the money, I mean, we'd be happy to do it. But for us to come up with, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars or something else like that, we just can't do that. We just we don't have the funds. So what what targets do you see as the most likely for you? Um, what areas of um, the whole drug discovery FCC testing model do you are, you are you just trying multiple ones and seeing which one will, will pop first? Well, so far, we've been pretty successful in being predictive for whatever model that people um, have asked us to build. Because that's we have some standard assays we do, but most of everything we do is somebody comes to us and says, okay, we want you to build this. Um, yeah, you've published this part over here, but we want you to take out the muscle and put in kidney. And, and because our system is very easily reconfigurable, we can do that. So most everything we've built is custom. And but they work pretty well in predicting what the compound um, was supposed to do, what they were expecting. Um, so we just want to keep building upon that, um, and it's publicly, especially you know trying to publish that research. And again, just get it out there that you know these things are not just it's not just us talking that they work. They've actually been validated, peer reviewed published in very high impact journals so they can actually start thinking scientifically that these things actually work. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. It's amazing. I'm just amazed you're able to model this stuff in such a, uh, I don't know called simple way, but uh, such a simple way. seems like it would need incredible sophistication to do this, but yet it's working. Well, one of the things is, is we, that's why we don't sell them. We don't sell the systems. We actually do it as a service based because it is very complicated. Um, and we want to have control over that. Um, because it is a complicated system that we're quite good at, uh, but it would take amazing amounts of training to get other people uh, up to speed, you know, if we just transferred our system to them. So ours is a service-based um, company. Um, unlike some of the other companies out there like Tissues or Emulate, which are trying to sell their systems, um, you know, but they're, you know, either they have to keep their systems really simple or they're it, it, they're finding difficulty getting um, you know people to seamlessly add them into their um, uh, 
research flow because they're complex. These are, these are pretty complex systems. And so far, there's only five companies out there that can do multi-organ systems at this point. Well, very good. So what, the, what do you see is happening in the next you know, three to five years? What do you hope uh, will be the result of what you're working on? I expect in three to five years that this will become a mainstream technology in the drug dis- development process. Um, I think that we will be able to get drugs using only human-on-a-chip data into clinical trials. I expect in some cases, in rare diseases, we might be able to go directly from our data into patients if there's clinical safety data. Um, you know, these are the kind of things that we see and are counting on to to push the technology and really fundamentally change how the drug discovery process occurs. And what what is the uh, your ideal of like the most sophisticated system that you'd ever want to make? How many organs would it include and what would it have? What would it look like? The most sophisticated system would be something where we could do systemic tox. Okay. So right now you, you have to go into an animal to do systemic tox. And systemic tox is you just put the drug in there after it's gone through all the other testing and say, okay, what is it we're going, you know, are we going to see something unknown that we didn't expect, you know, in the animals? And then they go for 28 days, they sacrifice the animals and they look and see if there's anything unexpected there. So the day we can actually build a multi-organ system that re- is accepted as a substitute for systemic tox, you won't need animals anymore. And hopefully that'll happen. We're, we hope so too. We, we're, we're really pushing really hard for that. And so exactly how many organs we need for that, um, not sure. Some people have published 10 organs already. Michael Schuler, you know, in his academic lab has published a 13 chamber with different cell types in it, okay, already. So we know it's possible to put many, many types of organs in these systems. Um, it's just whether or not it's necessary because the problem is, as you put in more and more organs, the cost goes up and the complexity goes up, you know, so we try to keep it as simple as possible to answer the question. But if we can get predict systemic tox, that will be the most complex system, um, that you would need in the drug discovery process. Are you going to try to do that or you need to stay in your zone of competence right now and that would take you out of it? Well, we actually got pretty far down the road. But in my academic lab, we were collaborating with L'Oreal for a number of years um, until their head of research, exploratory research, retired. Um, but uh, we got pretty far down the road of creating a systemic tox model because, you know, places like L'Oreal, you know, the EU has banned the use of animals in, in cosmetics. So they still have problems. You know, they still have to be able to predict systemic tox. Um, so it's not like the drug discovery, you know, industry where they can still use animals. It's not a problem. Cosmetics industry can't use them. So we got pretty far down the road. That was the one paper in advanced functional materials showing that we could get four organs interconnected for 28 days and be able to show functional activity for the entire time. That was the, you know, one of the results from that project with L'Oreal. Yeah, excellent. So what's the best way for folks to find out more and to get in contact um, visit our website and then send us an email um, or give us a call. And we're quite happy to talk to people. Well, we do webinars all the time with uh, companies who are interested in working with us. We kind of show them the data. Um, we then talk with them about what they want to try and be able to do. And we're very honest with people. If we can do it, we tell them we can do it. If we're not really sure, we'll say, okay, this is what the research we have to do. Or, you know, if there's somebody else, a competitor who can do it better, we send them off, off to the competitor. Do you have uh, any legacy webinars that you could link to, you know, maybe in the show notes? that we can look to for you? Um, there is some information on the website. We are putting together a uh, webinar for it to put on the website, but it's a brand new website uh, just created a couple months ago, and we're still adding to it. But we should have something, a webinar for the basic systems, but most of the technology is described on the website. Okay. Well, very good. Well, I appreciate you coming on the call, and that's uh, amazing stuff that you're working on. So hopefully you well, I appreciate there. talking to you as well, and um, um Quite happy to help. And again, I appreciate the opportunity to, uh, to talk to you about our, our research. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, but we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, 
figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials, or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription, or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.